Hey everyone, in this lesson I'm going to talk a little bit about Charles Darwin and his theory of evolution by means of natural selection and really taking a look at his ideas behind how populations do change over time and how new species do arise. So I'm starting off here with two main ideas. The first one, descent with modification. So descent, what we're talking about is generation after generation, the offspring that are left, and modification, the fact that with each successive generation, they're not exactly the same, but they have been modified in some way. In other words, the genetics of the population, it is going to be changing. If we do take a look at this picture that I have up at the right hand side here, a very simplified picture, showing where we do have one ancestral bird and then as time goes on what is taking place is eventually we have uh, more than one population and species of bird that is arising from the single one that we started off with in the first place. So a couple of the uh, quotes here from Charles Darwin from On the Origin of Species and I'm not going to read through the entire thing but he did say that regardless of what we do take a look at they did come from common parents that had been modified in the course of descent. So these two that we have at the top here, they did arise from the same sort of common parent that we have going back in time. And as long as we do have a sufficient amount of time, keeping in mind that it is extremely long periods of time that we're dealing with, and as long as we are preventing these populations from interbreeding, exchanging genetic information, interrupting that gene flow, in other words, having reproductive isolation, it can eventually give rise to two different species where we started with one. And then the second little bit here, he does say that, well, not only in the case of these birds that we're taking a look at, but if we go enough far back in time, then all organic beings, every single living organism on the planet would have descended from one primordial form into which life was first breathed. So he would have had no idea at the time when that actually was, but now we know that that is um, a long, long time ago, somewhere around 3.5 billion years ago that life would have arisen. So the second one here is the mechanism by which populations do change over time. So how does that actually happen? So he says here that, again, if you are given enough time, and if you do have some sort of a struggle that is taking place, the battle for life, and if you have, well, thousands of generations with descent and modifications, then those individuals that have some sort of an advantage, however slight it might be over the other ones, what they're going to get is, first of all, well, they're going to survive. And if you survive, what you also are able to do is procreate or reproduce. So those individuals that survive and reproduce are able to pass on the favorable variations and those which don't survive, well, of course, they're not going to be able to pass on those favorable variations. And as it says here, that is what Charles Darwin is calling natural selection. So many, many examples that we can take a look at. This is sort of a nice example here at the lower right hand side that shows us evolution in fast form. Forward. So evolution, for the most part, as Charles Darwin did say, takes thousands of generations, and that might be thousands and tens of thousands of years before we do have changes in populations to the extent that we do, in fact, have new species that too arise. But we can see evolution taking place on a smaller scale, small changes taking place, and that's exactly what we do see that it's showing in this picture. So initially what we have is a population of bugs or beetles and um, with any population there will be variation and we'll talk more about this variation shortly any population regardless of what it is the individuals are not all the same within the population there is genetic variability within the population and that genetic variability results in differences in terms of their traits and also their ability to survive 
So then what it shows is that what we have is, well, a human intervention, the application of an insecticide. This insecticide, the idea behind it is that it is going to end up killing these insects. However, within this population, already prior to exposure to the insecticide, prior to the exposure of the insecticide, there are some of these insects that due to variation will already have what we call a favorable mutation. The insecticide is not causing the mutation. The mutation was already there. It just did not provide any what we call selective advantage to those particular beetles until we started applying insecticide. So what would then happen upon the application of the insecticide is a whole bunch of these beetles are going to be well susceptible and they are going to die. But there are a few of them, the lucky ones in this case, which all of a sudden become the fittest individuals because they are the only ones that survived. They already had a mutation that provided them with the variation enabling them to survive. So again, all of these ones here die. This one here survives. What do you get to do if you survive? Well, you get to reproduce. So the next time this insecticide is applied, it's not going to kill quite as many of the beetles because more and more of them will be resistant. So as the generations go on with each successive generation, more and more of these insects will be resistant to the insecticide. They will have that mutation. It will become more common and the insecticide will become less and less effective. So realize here that we don't have the evolution of new species because this is over just a very short number of generations and it's only one single trait that we're talking about and that is the resistance to the insecticide. But if we have long, long, long periods of time, other mutations taking place, isolation of the population into two different groups so they're no longer able to interbreed. If we have a sufficient period of time, which there is in the geologic time scale, then that could be sufficient to lead to new species evolving. So we'll talk about five different points in Charles Darwin's theory of evolution by means of natural selection. So evolution is just meaning that a population is changing over time. Natural selection is the mechanism that Charles Darwin came up with to explain how this actually happens. So first of all, the picture that I'm showing here is a picture of walruses. And what we can see is that, well, there are a whole bunch of them. And in fact, in nature, this is the case that whatever population it is that we're talking about, there is an overproduction. And what I mean by that is that there are more individuals born than can possibly survive. They will not all survive because there are only so many resources available, a limited number of resources. There are not enough resources for all of the individuals that are born to possibly survive. So many of them are destined to die. So there's a battle that's going on. There is competition that is going on, and the most intense competition is competition that is between members of the same species because what they want is exactly the same thing. They are competing for exactly the same limited resources. So whether it is food, whether it's water, whether it's sunlight if we're talking about plants or soil nutrients, there is competition that's taking place, and there is what's referred to as the struggle for existence, the battle that is going on between individuals of the same species. Now, I mentioned this one, there is variation within the population. The individuals, they're each unique. Unless there is an identical twin, each individual within the population they are unique in terms of their genetic information or their DNA. The original source, the original source of this variation is due to mutations and through sexual reproduction, sperm and eggs that are produced will also be variable and that leads to variations within the next generation. So if we take a look at this picture here, these three fish that we have on the left hand side, they may all be members of the same species, but they look a little bit different. So why they do look a little bit different 
is because of their genetic makeup, because of their DNA. Where that originally came from is due to mutations. Same thing with the snails that we're taking a look at at the upper right-hand side. They are different. They're all genetically unique. So because they are all unique and different, they have different traits, and some of them are what we say fitter than others. They are better suited to their environment. So what makes them better suited to their environment is that they are better able to access the limited resources that are there. So what we then end up having is survival of those individuals that are the fittest, survival of the fittest. So individuals with traits that allow them to better access the resources, they are better competitors, for those limited resources, they are the ones, well, that as we saw with the bugs, they're able to survive, they're able to reproduce, they're able to pass that advantageous trait on to the next generation, and generation after generation, what we see is that particular trait becomes more common within the population, and those traits that are not as beneficial, they become less common within the population. And finally, Charles Darwin's book was on the origin of species. So how does that actually happen, the origin of species or what is referred to as speciation? Once again, this is going to have to take place over long, long periods of time and many, many generations. If we do have, once again, an initial population and that population becomes separated into two smaller or more than two smaller populations, each one of those populations begins to accumulate differences in terms of their genetics, different traits, independently of each other. And eventually, over time, they become so different that if they do eventually come back together, they may no longer be able to interbreed, and then we would describe them as being separate species. So um, if we do we just talk a little bit about our own species, Homo sapiens. So this picture here, it shows us that if we go far enough back in time, maybe about half a million years ago, we actually had a common ancestor between our species, Homo sapiens, which is this line here, and another population which in fact may just be a subspecies of Homo sapiens, which are the Neanderthals. So Neanderthals, they did go extinct. The last ones they think were around about 30,000 years ago. So what exactly happened to them? Well, probably to some extent we outcompeted them. But it appears now that we did also interbreed with the Neanderthal population, which would mean that, well, probably they were, in fact, members of the same species and just a different subspecies. At any rate, the Neanderthals are no longer around. What are left in terms of the Homo species are only Homo sapiens. So what's also kind of interesting about this picture is it does show that um, Homo sapiens, they did migrate out of Africa, and that was around about 100,000 years ago. There would have been Neanderthals already in Asia and Europe prior to that, but Homo sapiens, they think, migrated out of Africa probably in several different waves between about 100,000 and 70,000 years ago, and they moved to different parts of the world, all of the different parts of the world. So if we do take a look at this picture here, what it shows is that, well, what would happen, what could have happened if the African population was then isolated from those populations that migrated to Europe, to Asia, to Australia, and we could also put in here North America. Well, if they did remain isolated for, again, long periods of time, maybe we're talking a million years, then it may eventually have given rise to different populations of Homo sapiens and different species. As we know, of course, this is not what happened. Due to international travel that we have, we are not members of different species. We are all one single species. In fact, we're all one single population. 